just clinicians. It is clinical trialists because there is not only an art but a science in developing the best clinical trials. Uh, along the points that both of you have made, I think we are also facing another challenge. And that is that if multiple companies have drugs of the same family, yeah. it is not necessarily the best drug that will get ahead, but it's sometimes the drug of the company that is more aggressive or bigger or richer. And we have had several recent examples of how, because of that phenomenon, the phase three trial fails, for instance, in Iparib, um, although there are other examples. And I think something that the pharmaceutical industry has been somewhat resistant to is for the academic community to help them select before getting to phase two or phase three trials. You're correct, there are, I don't know, several dozen PI3 kinase inhibitors or inhibitors of that pathway. Nobody except the company that develops them gets access to them in a meaningful way to compare them to all of the others. And we often end up killing potentially good drugs and not and, and testing drugs that perhaps do not deserve. But sometimes the transition from the preclinical to the phase one is also not good enough. So many times, uh, if yeah, you, that's a good point. I, I think that we could, uh, the academics could do a checklist, and if you don't have the checklist every cross, you shouldn't do the clinical trials on mechanism of action, right. target, target validation, significance of the target in, in, in patient and pharmacokinetics. Many drugs fail because in clinical trials they don't achieve good uh, plasma levels. Others because the target is not the target. Other times because the target is not expressed. So there are many things that are incredibly um, atypical that I think uh, there is a lot of room to improve and to do a faster and better drug development if we focus more on the preclinical and also on the biological significance of the biomarkers in tumor samples. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes with one or two experiments, uh, the, the companies and the clinicians go ahead with a clinical trial. And I think at the end, this is not the best. Thing. How do you foresee the future of chemotherapy from now in the next 20 years? Mm. In cancer in general, not, not immune cancer, in cancer. Do you see that chemotherapy will have a role in 20 years? Well, let me get started with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and um, I left my crystal ball in, uh, in Houston. Uh, I think chemotherapy will be around, not for everybody. But I think of chemotherapy uh, in the future as, the, uh, as a form of surgery. It's a rough way to reduce extent of disease. And then make um, our other treatments, our biologicals, our targeted treatments, perhaps more effective. Now, we will probably not need it for the um, imatinibs of the world or the ALK inhibitors of the world, but in the common solid tumors, there are, very, there are going to be very few of those targets. So I predict that there will still be chemotherapy in 20 years. We will still be arguing about adriamycin uh, but we will still use it in some patients. I like to avoid the administration of chemotherapy to my patient because it's a very rough way to kill the cancer. But I agree that probably it will be difficult to push out this type of treatment because in some cancer, the effect is here and we are able to cure those cancers with the chemotherapy and it probably remain a backbone in the majority of our cancer and we will still talk about adriamycin or taxoti or taxol in 10 years. But I believe that the level of activity and the overall benefit that we achieve with chemotherapy for now two decades around will be, I will say, its maximum of benefit and we will add nothing more with the chemotherapy at the future. So the proportion of use of chemotherapy will decrease. But 
we still have a need for this type of treatment. How we consider TDM1? Is a chemotherapy targeted <laughs> agent or not? Huh? Because, because I think that finally, when we are in, in, in a situation where we are not able to cure patients, these new agents, new target therapies, will probably move to first, second line in many, many tumors and situations when we will be able to define the target. But at one point, patients will fail to this treatment. And we will find that if we have chemotherapy that could increase survival to these patients with good quality of life, I'm not talking about high dose chemotherapy as we do, as we did 20 years ago. I'm not talking about giving tax and plus anthracyclines, plus vinyl being at some point, but it's just to play and to manage those patients with single agent therapies. I think that chemotherapy will continue to be a standard treatment for the vast majority of patients with metastatic disease. And at one point one can think, okay, capecitabine is a chemotherapy, but it's more toxic, it's worse tolerated than shouldn't? I think no. So at some point, I think that all patients with metastatic disease will continue to confront chemotherapy because it's a good treatment. And uh, if we are able to maintain patients' quality of life over years and years with targeted therapy, they still will be on good performance status to receive care.